Welcome to the Mayo Clinic Cardiovascular Continuing Medical Education Podcast. Join us each week to discuss the most pressing topics in cardiology and gain valuable insights that can be directly applied to your practice. Hello, I'm Dr. Steve Kopetsky, a preventive cardiologist at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. And today it's a great pleasure to be speaking with Dr. Bruce Johnson, a professor of medicine and the consultant in the Department of Cardiovascular Medicine here in Rochester, Minnesota, and a very good friend. Bruce uh, will be, and I will be talking about the heart in the mountains. Also, what is what happens to the heart at altitude? So welcome, Bruce. Welcome. Now, Bruce, you have, uh, you have been to many of the top mountains in the world, Mount Kilimanjaro, Mount, uh, Mount Everest, uh, Mount Aconcagua in South America, the highest mountains in the South Pole. The, um, how did you get into this, into this research that you do? Well, I'd like to say that in my youth I was an athlete and interested in human performance and in the limits of human performance. And so as sort of my career path unfolded, I ended up working with the Department of Defense in a high altitude group and have just had that exposure at the same time I've had this, um, this interest. And, and so it's just, to me, it's fascinating um, the limits of what we can adapt to as humans. And um, our last study was in Chamonix, France, and we've been studying these people that run 100 miles around the Alps and Mount Blanc. And it's incredible what the human body can adapt to. Fascinating. So what happens to the heart when we go to high altitudes and how much altitude does it take? Yeah, well, that's a good question. Um, so most of us in our daily activities, you know, we, we aren't exposed much to the mountains, but we may go on a ski trip or go on a hiking trip. And at least across America, you know, there's a good chance we may get up to eight, 10 or 12,000 feet or even a little bit higher. And the high altitude range has been defined as the eight to 12,000 um, foot range or about I suppose 2,500 to almost 4,000 meters. And at that range, 8,000 feet and above, is when we probably start to see some of the risks associated with the hypoxia of high altitude. And so if we saturate, say, 100% at sea level, what do we do at 12,000 feet? So I can give you an example. Um, so we went down to Antarctica to study kind of the occupational movement of people from sea level to the South Pole. And a lot of people don't realize that the U.S. South Pole station sits on about two miles of ice. And because of the kind of the depression of our atmosphere at the poles, the physiologic challenge is significant. And I think in about 250 people at a physiologic altitude of about 10,000 feet, the average oxygen saturation was around 88 or 89 percent compared to 97, 98 at sea level. But I think an interesting finding, at least in that study and in others, is that when we fall asleep, our saturations tend to drift downward. And in fact, in that study, um, people's saturations dropped to 83 or 4, 84%, which is almost like at night climbing an additional 500 to 1,000 meters. So there's significant more challenge when you fall asleep at night. Oh, that's interesting. So would they have symptoms at night? Would they wake up with headaches? Do they have sleep apnea, functional sleep apnea with that percent? So a lot of people will develop um, forms of more central sleep apnea, almost like cluster breathing or periodic breathing. They may wake up kind of gasping. Um, we've got kind of competing sensory inputs to breathe. One is telling us to breathe more and then our brain, because of the low carbon dioxide, is trying to slow us down. And so I think that 
kind of sets up this oscillation. But I know in our studies, we've felt like it's the nighttime desaturations and overall hypoxic stress that kind of triggers more of the high altitude symptoms. Gotcha. And then what happens at altitude? What happens to the myocardial blood flow? So we haven't studied that ourselves specifically, but uh, the studies that um, I'm familiar with have shown that resting uh, at the resting state, the coronary arteries, especially epicardial, tend to dilate and coronary blood flow goes up. And so oxygen content and, and cardiac function are essentially maintained. And even at really relatively high altitudes, with exercise, cardiac blood flow reserve is preserved. And there was years ago an, a simulated ascent of Everest in a chamber over 40 days where they looked for cardiac ischemia. And even as high as the summit of Everest, there was no evidence of cardiac ischemia. So well, we can really adapt at pretty high altitudes. Pretty well. That's amazing. The, and what about arrhythmias? Is, is high altitude pro-arrhythmic? I think that's also a little controversial, but again, um, the healthy heart can adapt really well to the challenge. And in the studies that I've reviewed, I think there's very little evidence up to about 4,500 meters of any pro-arrhythmic issues associated with altitude. There was one study where they used the reveal device um, at more significant altitudes, and they did see some Brady and um, tachy arrhythmias, but no um, sustained ventricular arrhythmias that I'm aware of. Mm -hmm. So I assume that this is like most things that we find in medicine, it, that there's a bell-shaped curve for response. Some people can probably go to much higher altitudes, some to much lower altitudes, and have the same symptoms or lack or, or presence of them. Is there a range that you found where things start to occur more and where almost everybody gets them at the high end? Or? Yeah, it, it's somewhat hard to predict. I mean, one of our goals of the um, South Pole study was that everybody came in um, to sea level and then made the jump to altitude in a uniform way. And so we were trying to look at, you know, what are some of the risk factors associated with um, developing more severe symptoms. And I mean, most of the studies suggest how rapidly you're exposed. In other words, if you go, you know, by car to the summit of um, Pikes Peak, you're likely to have more symptoms. The symptoms, um, again, where you sleep or the, the altitude where you sleep seems to promote more symptoms. Um, hydration levels are important. We found in, again, in the, in the South Pole study that LDL cholesterol actually higher levels were a little bit protective. But then, so we, we think proteins in the blood, you know, may help you hold on to fluid better. So there is a diuresis that occurs at altitude that um, may be protective. But then when we looked at statin use, actually it lowered LDL, but it was also associated with fewer symptoms. So we're thinking maybe the anti-inflammatory properties of statins um, play a role. We did um, explore some gene expression type studies and we did find a lot of the inflammatory pathways kind of lit up with the initial exposure to altitude. So um, things like ibuprofen, you know, are known to have some benefit as far as headaches and some of those symptoms. Hmm. And do you ever see an increase in plaque rupture with, you know, after high altitude? Or? I'm not a aware of, you know, and again, we haven't studied patients with known coronary disease. Um, I know there have been some studies on patients with um, kind of shunts and things that seem to increase risk, but I'm not aware of um, significant increases or increased risk of plaque rupture. I think because of the hemoconcentration, um, 
there may be some slight um, increased risk of you know clotting type mechanisms but again we haven't um, studied that in any detail hmm. Now, you mentioned a minute ago about some of the risk factors. I assume you were talking about risk factors more for high altitude sickness. Right. And so you mentioned uh, the rapidity with which you go up, how high you go up, your hydration levels. What about genetics? Any discoveries about genetics and specifically some of the, like the Sherpa guides that seem to be able to adapt to higher altitudes? Yeah, they, they have done studies and they found the occasional um, you know, single nucleotide um, polymorphism that seems to be more associated. We've we've been interested in some of the adrenergic receptors, and I think some of the nitric oxide related pathways seem to have some mild association. Um, I mean, the Sherpas have been a group that have lived a long time at altitude, and. They tend to be shorter, their lungs are bigger, they're more barrel-chested. Um, there is some evidence that people with big lungs that can have a large increase in lung surface area, um, maybe when you get a little bit of hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction, you, you get less of a load on the right heart. I think there's some evidence those people consistently do better at altitude. There's also been some studies kind of comparing um, people in the Andes versus people in um, Nepal um, on some of the differences between the groups. And in the Andes, they tend to have more of a uh, polycythemic response. They get more red cells and there's more incidence of chronic mountain sickness, which is caused by kind of the sludgy blood Whereas in the Himalayas, they don't seem to have as much of a rise in hemoglobin hematocrit as you might think. And some of that's probably genetic, I you see. know, adaptive. I see. And so what's the highest altitude that humans live at? Well, I think, um, again, in the Himalayan areas, the highest um, consistent villages where people live year round, I think are around 13,000 foot um, area. There are mining camps in the Andes where they've pushed this limit up closer to 15,000 and people seem um, to survive, you know. There is a drop off in um, kind of birth rates and other challenges. And so I think it's a little unknown over time how far humans could potentially adapt if, if they had enough, you know, exposure and enough generations. So that, that's just fascinating. And so when the average human flies in an airplane, pressurized cabin, what did, you know, we'll go to 30,000 feet, 35,000 feet. What's the pressure in there? What's the oxygen in there? Is it just like on the ground? Again, at altitude, there's the percentage of oxygen is the same from sea level all the way up. And it's the pressure that really dictates the oxygen that's available to us. And I think most planes, it's in that 7,500 to 8,000 foot kind of pressure equivalent. But again, for most of us, these are short trips. We're sitting, um, you know, so it's it's a pretty mild exposure. Now, if you had chronic disease or um, issues that could compromise in oxygenation, then you know you might have more issues. Mm -hmm, certainly. Well, this has just been a fascinating discussion. So basically, uh, what Dr. Johnson has told us is that our heart is very adaptable, even at higher altitudes, that we can survive and do quite well. We don't get myocardial ischemia. Uh, the heart really is an, a, a wonderful organ, as we're all aware, that uh, that can adapt to many conditions. Any, any parting words, Dr. Johnson, any parting wisdom for us? No, I think, um, you know, some of our newer studies are focused on potential additive health benefits, benefits from altitude exposure and um, or intermittent types of simulated altitude exposure. And so I think in some of our forward thinking ideas is that even people with relatively significant disease, 
there may be some benefits of very um, graded and um, reasonable exposures to altitude. And the benefits would be where? Um, there's some evidence, again, that it affects immune, fu immune function. Um, it, it may affect some of the regenerative capacity of cells. And, um, and we know it already helps stimulate oxygen transport. And mm -hmm. one of the big um, proteins is erythropoietin that seems to play a role in a lot of these kind of health-related processes. Mm -hmm. Well, that's fascinating. Well, thank you, Dr. Johnson, for giving us your wisdom and, and the many years you've spent uh, looking and studying uh, humans at high altitudes. Thank you again. All right. Thanks, Steve. Thank you for joining us today. Feel free to share your thoughts and suggestions about the podcast by emailing cvselfstudy at mayo.edu. Be sure to subscribe to the Mayo Clinic Cardiovascular CME podcast on your favorite platform and tune in each week to explore today's most pressing cardiology topics with your colleagues at Mayo Clinic.